Welcome to Future Learners, the show designed to empower students, parents and educators. Join us as we explore the ever-evolving landscape of schooling, learning and what it takes to succeed in today's world. This episode is brought to you by Yuka Future Learning, Australia's largest online, full-time education provider for pre-K through 12 students seeking a flexible, relevant and meaningful education. Visit yuka.edu.au today. Hello and welcome to another episode of Future Learners. I am Brett Campbell, Chairman and CEO of UCA Future Learning, and I'm joined by my most beautiful co-host, as always, uh, Ellen Brown, who is the founder and our Head of Education here at UCA. So, Ellen, how are you doing today? Good. Really excited to get into it. Absolutely. We're talking about uh, a couple of, well, specifically uh, a specific topic that's pretty hot off the press and uh, depending what what uh, universe you live in, I'm going to make the assumption that you've certainly heard a lot of these words that we're going to talk about today. Um, I don't even know if it's a word. It's almost like two letters, isn't it? Like AI, but uh, I'll let the cat out of the bag there a little bit. I'm going to hand to you though, Alan, set us up for this episode. What are we really going to talk about? And also, why do you believe this is an important topic for us to talk about? Because I know this is one that you really wanted to dive into. Yeah, I am excited to talk about it because, you know, I guess, Some people would say we're facing a crisis in education and other people would say, you know, it's a revolution in education. And, you know, just like everything else that's changed in in education over the last hundred years, you know, there was a time where people would go, calculators, that's going to ruin, nobody will know how to do any maths anymore, you know, or spell check. Now our kids will never know how to spell anything. And uh, and I, I think it's probably, you know, this episode will be great to dispel some of the fears and actually start to look with enthusiasm at what the future of education will look like with AI. Yeah, it, it, you, you touched on a couple of things there. Firstly, I just want to do a shout out to Spellcheck, one of the greatest inventions ever. The amount, I, I think if you looked at my mouse pad and the clicking configuration there's always the right click underline <laughs> change the change the spelling um but it's interesting because this feeds into even a larger topic and i was actually just talking about this recently um we did a, a news article on channel 9 sorry uh, like a, an interview on channel 9 i'm um, talking about you know uh, homeschooling and the future of learning and and you know having children and this sort of feeds off one of our past episodes about children not wanting to go to school anymore school refusal all of those things and and I was talking to the reporter and one of the the things that um, I really tried to cement is that we're living in a world of exponential technology and exponential pace right things are changing rapidly if you look at what's happened in the last 15 years versus the last 1500 years there's been more technology evolution in the last five years and there has been pre-humanity to be fair and what is happening is we're still walking this earth and we're still trying to live this life that we're living with a very old frame of mind in the way in which we look at it right like when the internet came out it was like oh my god there's this thing and you'd you'd boil the kettle and you'd wait for three minutes for the dial up to connect and you'd be like this is the and you'd see an image downloading on your screen like bit by bit, right? You're like, oh my God, here it is. What is it? You know, to now we're, we've literally launched uh, chips, microchips that you can put in your brain to be able to start seeing things. So that the speed in which things have evolved um, has not brought our minds along for the ride, right? So for people who don't like change, it's been an unbelievably um, scary time for them because there's been change almost weekly daily and in some cases with what's happening with technology and as we look at it at the intersection of where uh you know technology meets education to your point earlier is there's so much upside opportunity for this but there also is and we can't negate the downside potential risks and pitfalls that this concept of ai and um technology can can really have an impact on. So, um, where do you want to where do you want to kick off? What do you want to dive into first? Because I, I love this topic. I love technology. I I pay a lot of close attention to what is happening in the technological space. Yeah, I've been looking at um, AI for like the last ten years when 
AI and AR. So AR hasn't been talked about much that recently, but AR was a huge buzzword back, you know, ten years ago. Um, obviously, it's evolving right now. But so I, I pay a lot of attention to this, and I could probably start in any area. And I'm going to need you to pull me <laughs> back in and go. Where do we start? Right. Ella? Let's let's talk about Look, this. I love I it. I think probably the the place to start is what is happening right now. So. What we're seeing now, like you just said a minute ago, Brett, you're right. Like we, none of us really like change. I think even the people who are at the head of, of change, it's still an uncomfortable feeling. Like change is, is, um, brings discomfort, but it's not something we can choose. You know, it's something that's definitely, um, part of our life. And interestingly in education at the moment, you know, the teachers that are in education are the last ones that were born before the digital age really began. So the year 2000, like before the year 2000, technology was a tool that we used. Whereas now kids born after 2000, we could almost say I've heard the term digital native as a word. So they don't see technology as a tool, but rather it's their environment that they're actually living in. Not that they're living in a fake environment, but everything they've ever known is technology. And so we're in this really tricky place in education at the moment where teachers are, you know, it's that fight or flight thing, you know, do we, we've got to ban the phones because they're on the phones and we've got to, how are we going to get enough tools to check whether AI has written this or it hasn't? We've got to ban chat GPT or we've got to, and, and at the end of the day, we need to be forward thinking. So right now in education, there's this big, um, I guess you'd call it a bit of a war on how we're going to manage it. And and looking for being forward thinking is going to be the only way out of that kind of um, conflict that we're facing in education at the moment. The trouble in education is that it's a very slow moving process and that sort of has worked okay. You know, it's taken 10 years for new curriculum to come out and it's a really big juggernaut really um, when it comes to curriculum and, and the way teachers are being taught and it's just no time uh, to, for catch up. You know, there's not going to be tools that are going to be created quick enough to say, has AI done this? So we're going to have to be forward thinking. So that's, I guess, where I want to look at this. And, and I'm not saying, you know, let's ignore that there's difficult things, but those difficult parts of technology and AI that are going to play a part in our kids' role, in our kids' lives, we need to start working out how we're going to prepare them for those things rather than saying we're going to try and limited or cut it off or you know check if it's there we need to we need to be forward thinking about it a, a couple of things that you said there that i'm going to double tap on is and this is probably a starting point as a as a parent to to look through the lens of technology is here and it is not going away it's only going to get more prevalent and more rapid changes so the first thing is is to embrace that it is here because the ignorance around it now is no longer an applicable argument. For example, when mobile phones came out, there'd be the running joke that you can't get your mum or your grandma on the mobile phone because like, I'm not, I don't know technology. It's like, you can no longer use the, I'm just not technically savvy excuses because that is basically saying, I am unable to operate my life now because everything is technology. The way in which you order groceries online can be now technology. In the next few years, you're probably not even gonna have grocery stores like it's, it's happening and it's going to change. And, and whilst, you know, it, it can become, um, uh, well, it can become uncomfortable is the unfortunate reality is you just have to embrace it and reconcile that it is happening and it's not going anywhere. So that's probably the first thing that I just really want to, um, highlight there because change, I, I look at change through the lens of the, the bigger, the impact of the change, the bigger, the downside risk of the change as well. It's like anything, right? The, the world is always in equilibrium trying to bring itself back to balance. So it's generally the higher, the higher, the lower, the low, right? The more you love someone, the more the heartbreak is if, if you end up departing from each other, right? So the, the concept there is that it is going to happen. We need to embrace it. It's already happening uh, and, and be ready for that. Now, the other part that you mentioned there that I just wanted to, to highlight as well is we do live in a world now where the way in which we look at education and our ability to find information, to access information and use said information to create an outcome has changed rapidly. You no longer need to now 
to know everything about a specific thing. You could literally go to YouTube and go, how do I, how do I fix my coffee machine? How do I do X, Y, Z? Talk to me about Pythagoras theorem. Not that anyone would need to do that, but the reality is you no longer need to. What we need to do is change the way in which we look at how we learn. And this comes back to one of the one of the main things amongst many that I love about what we do um, with Yuka is we don't have big exams. You don't sit an exam and put all of your eggs in one basket on this one exam. And hopefully you've remembered every answer or everything that you need to for a two hour exam, which tests you over a year. It just it, We also need to go, hold on a minute. That probably doesn't make the most sense. The ability to be right and wrong in this world is something that we should embrace because tests set you up for now i'm not against tests in some cases because there's some cases where you just have to have a specific test to go is this person even competent in this right i'm not going to hop on an airplane if the pilot doesn't know what to do in an emergency right so i need there, there's tests that need to be um implemented but in the majority here in which we're talking about is the way in which learning is evolved ai is at the upper echelon of this because but even before AI, Google was such an advancement in the way in which we can learn. I mean, when I was a kid, we'd have encyclopedias. And I mean, I've actually got the behind me here, if you're watching on the video um, on YouTube, is I've literally got a set of the world's greatest books behind me. You've got encyclopedias behind you. Like these things are going to become antiques, right? Well, they pretty much are antiques in many ways. Um, but if I wanted to find any bit of information, I'd have to go to a book and hope the table of contents was good enough to point me in the topic of what I'm looking at. And then I'd have to scan and read and look at, and that was my only source. I never had 50 books that I could go to to get a, a more refined answer. So even the advancement of you know, the internet, they're moving into Google and the ability to search terms. And now we're living in a world with the advancement of chat GPT that has been the biggest buzzwords over the last probably 18 months in many cases, is now you have the ability to, actually not even have to go to Google. You can go to your very own AI bot in your pocket and app and say, hey, I'm looking to do this. Can you do this? I want to plan a trip around New Zealand. Can you tell me the five major spots that I should be stopping at if I'm doing X, Y, Z? And then all of a sudden, like the speed, and I have to say, I, I was blown away. I, and I am still blown away by the proficiency of the answers that are being provided whilst we also cannot and this is the danger of it people a lot of people can be very gullible and whatever they read on google is like well that must be the truth so we also don't want to trap ourselves into this one dimensional way of thinking and go whatever chat gpt tells me that must be right which comes back to and i'll and i'll stop on this point and, and throw back to you in a second is teaching our children how to critically think and how to actually take multiple different sources from different areas which can be very well defined and articulated and and you look at five different areas you're like well there's some real similarities in all of these but there's some differences and nuance in that here's where i've arrived at this is my source of truth and i think that's a far greater conversation that we need to have around not what ai is going to do how are we going to manage and adopt <laughs> AI. Yeah. Look, you're exactly right. And and I feel exactly the same about Yuka and our opportunity to redefine what intelligence is. And the whole the whole world has to redefine intelligence because it no longer is the accumulation of knowledge or recall of facts. Those things can no longer be how we measure intelligence, you know, and that gives us then the opportunity to say, well, how do we measure it and how do we instill responsible use of technology and help them to navigate a digital landscape that these kids are growing up in? And it's things that we're putting into place in our program and, and focusing on our education, things like analytical thinking, critical thinking, resilience and motivation, self-awareness, curiosity, um, hands-on education. And that's the funny thing about it. You know, we, we're talking about AI and how how fantastic all the different um, technologies are, but being able to use things in a practical way is going to be really important in learning coming up. And that doesn't mean that you have to go and make volcanoes all the time, but there's some fantastic AI-supported 
hands-on learning tools. I saw one, I don't know if you've seen one, it's, um, it starts with lab, lab something or other, but it gives you the opportunity in AI to go into a lab and get all different chemicals and mix them up and see what the reaction is. And, and I mean, that's amazing because here we are now in a situation where kids who don't have access to things like science labs and all the different chemicals and, um, and even the safety behind all of those things, they have actual real life experience in doing that without actually having to go do it. So, um, it's, there's so many possibilities. I suppose the big thing is once you go, okay, it's not going to change. We've all got to get on board. This is the way it is. It's about being able to say, okay, where is the big plus? And I feel like we're starting to see that for our parents who are who are with UCA, for our students who are with UCA. Basically, AI absolutely levels the playing field because a child at home is is never going. Or even kids who are at school and they go home with their homework or anything, all of a sudden everybody has access to this AI generated absolutely amazing teacher in at home and so you're not limited by my parents are working late and I don't have support or anything like that or I'm in a place where I don't have the same opportunities every child on the planet will have have access to an AI generated tutor and uh and that just that that is great for parents and as far as teachers are concerned it means every teacher has an AI generated assistant that they can call on so it um, it really does take away some of the limiting factors in in our students' education. So that's a big plus. So, something I think about quite often, and as a father now of you know coming up three, almost sixteen year old daughter, um, the adoption of technology. Because yeah, when I got home from school. I'd be outside playing with my mates, kicking a football, playing cricket, you know, mowing lawns, doing whatever it was, but it was all outside. And then it would get dark and then I'd get called in to come and have dinner. That was sort of every day after school for me as I was sort of growing up. And I never had mobile phones, so that was obviously, you know, a, a big part as to why I was outside because it was like it was either that or I'd sit inside, but my mum wouldn't let me just sit there and watch TV. So that was one of the rules that we had in the house. And this is where what I really want to talk about here is setting the guidelines of how you're going to use technology and not let technology use you. Okay. That, because all of these cool apps that can do all these amazing things, we could sit here and share hundreds of different things that would exponentially speed up anything that you think you could do. Um, Yeah. You could talk to your phone and say, Here's my grocery list. I need this, 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 walking through the cupboard. And then you literally got your own AI bot that can go shopping with you and make sure you got every, like everything is already attainable in regards to speeding up whatever it is that you're doing. What it comes back to though is, are you going to use it or is it going to use you? So Ayla, and I say this to every, every parent, um, I was very naive coming into it as a parent. I'd be out at dinner and I'd see parents with their kids on iPads and phones. I'm like, oh my gosh, what a bad parent. Like your your kids should be engaged with you sitting there at the dinner table eating. And every parent here now listening who's been through this is like, ah, I've done the same thing where I literally had no idea. And now that I, when I take my daughter out and no matter how good a communicator I believe I am or how well I think I can um, control a situation or help a situation, uh, there's just sometimes no telling a two or a three-year-old what they need to do. And I now I'm like, okay, well, you can have the phone if it, if it gets to a specific point. And it's like you're watching your favorite show. And then I'm like, oh, my God, what am I doing? I'm now letting her be on her phone. She shouldn't be on her phone. And I'm comparing my decisions based off I wasn't on my phone. That's not what we, that's not how I grew up. And, and this again is as a, as a, you know, a parent is we hold a lot of old school beliefs, you know, because we're like, well, I had a great childhood. I was, I was outside. Why should my child be watching their mobile phone or their video or their, this or their YouTube, or why should they be gaming? You know, but the reality is, is all of these things are here. We just need to set parameters around it 
and then make sure that the parameters that you are setting around it, and this sort of feeds back into a previous episode we talked about about your rules as a family, right? Whether you're homeschooling or you're not homeschooling, it's, it's a really good exercise to sit down with your family and set the guidelines of, hey, these are the parameters that we're working in. Now, whether you want to be to the point where you're like, you can use any of these AI tools as much as you need to during your learning journey, through your um, schooling, through you, whether you're, you're homeschooling or in school. But then it's the use of said technology outside of that. That's where I believe the detriment can start to accrue because if you're learning something and you have the ability there to get an answer quickly and you can move through it faster and you can understand it, then I mean, all for that, right? If you can put a headset on and you can experience what it, like you could put yourself at an experience where you are standing under a waterfall and you know what the the water feels like to to get you more connected to said topic that you're learning. I mean, what an amazing outcome that is, right? But I think where a lot of parents get concerned is it's this 24-7 connection to said technology. Now, you've got you have five children. So what is, and multiple different age groups, what's your, I'd be interested to see, what's, what's your thesis around how have you tried to adopt technology, the use of it during learning and, and outside yeah, of learning? Look, I, I, I actually laugh because um, I know a lot of people who'd be like, oh, look at that child on the, on the, you know, iPad while, while they're at dinner. But if, if we're real, if people who are like that are real, they'd say, well, you know, when we went out for dinner, I took a coloring book and my child was coloring it. What's the difference? You know what I mean? They're engaged in something. You just don't have to go and pick up 20 pencils all over the restaurant floor because the child's coloring. The child was never sitting. Yeah, it's a lot. Not yeah, the reality is the child was never sitting at, like, you know, when we went out for dinner as a child, we didn't sit there and listen to their parents' conversation, nor should we because that's parent conversation, the adult conversation. Uh, we were always occupied doing something. So if they're on the iPad or if they're on the coloring in book or if they're on whatever else, they're doing something. So I think that a lot of those kind of parents, if they're really honest with themselves, realize that the kids were busy doing something else. It's just that it's easier to pack up now than it was back then. But like you say, you know, I have um, I have had to navigate it, not with tiny little ones where it is now there's so many more things to do, but I don't think it's any different to, you know, back in the day, there'd be kids that would prefer to be inside and they just want to sit and do Meccano or um, something like that. And the parents would have to say, you know what, you've got to spend some time outside. And they would do the things that we do right now and say, you know, let's join a sport. Let's get a friend who also likes Meccano and you can do it together with your buddy. It's just about realizing that really it's the activity that's changed, but you still need to, as a parent, make sure that they're doing things that, that provide them time outside of the technology sphere that they are in. And it's not that they're not being social. They're very social on their games and things. But I've always found that as long as I make sure there's attractive uh, other opportunities that are attractive so that if they're, you know, going on a bike ride, it might mean that I've got to put a bit of effort in. You know, I I remember back when I was a kid, my mum would say, you're not allowed to come back in until the lights come on outside. So off you go, you know, you can't do that. You can't do that anymore. So you have to be a bit more interactive and say, okay, on Tuesdays, we're going for a bike ride or we're going to the park or we're going to go and grab some friends and take them to the local pool. You have to be a little bit more proactive, but making sure there's there's exciting opportunities outside of that technology sphere is really important. Yeah, I, I think the it keeps coming back to me is, is architecting what fits well for your child and your family as it pertains to technology and and if I, I know there's certain countries, I know China, they've they've implemented bans and limitations on, you know, gaming. Like your child can only game for well, one hour a day. Like I mean, we I would never want to live in a society where the government tells me what I to do. I think some parents um, would. Yeah, I I want to be responsible. <laughs> some parents. Well, some parents would. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's right. But in the same token, you know, the the reality is is the rule within itself is the thing that we really need to look to implement and. And it's setting those barriers and setting those guidelines. And and if it's a certain limitation on gaming or a certain limitation on phone, because here's the other part of technology that we haven't even really looked at. And it depends how far you go down rabbit holes, but we're living in such a time where technology is a part of everything. We're sitting here, we've got a camera, 
that is facing us that has electricity running into it. We've got a computer screen that's in front of us. We've got everything connected up to electricity. We've got our mobile phones. You, And then what we don't know is what role does that actually have to play in the health and well-being of us long-term as, as humans? Is there detriments to being on your iPhone for five hours a day, three hours a day? It comes back to books, right? This is one of the big things for me is I, I like reading on Kindle or my iPhone for speed of downloading information into my mind. Like I can go through it really quickly. I can have, you know, I've got about a thousand books on my iPhone um, that I've downloaded and, and brought. Um, but there's also that if I really want to adopt a book differently and, and feel the book a little bit more, and when I say feel it, not as in just holding it, although that is the method in which I would read it is I would hold the book, but I feel it a little bit more. So there's there's different different outcomes that you can get from the way in which you source information, right? Like there is, no matter what good of AR headset right now, VR headset that you would put on, it's just not going to be as good as standing under the waterfall and actually, because then you're going to be able to smell the water, smell every, like you're getting all your six senses versus a couple of two, three of them working through this technology. But I think it really comes back to is just looking at where is technology best used? How are you going to adopt it as a family? Um, and then how are you going to measure if that is success or if you need to come back and adjust the parameters that you've set? Because um, as it pertains to education, you know, ourselves, Yuka especially, and, and you know, every online company is going to embrace and, and want to maximize and, and use this to create a a greater, better, unique experience. You know, with the advancement of of artificial intelligences and things that we've got coming down the pipeline with what we're building at Yuka is is you your technology can work so fast, like, you know, without even a, a split second, it can work so fast that it can over time it can train on the way in which you interact or it's like you've spent maybe too long on this lesson and maybe it's like a, hey we notice that you're you're having a little bit of trouble with this or is there something we can help you with and so assisted learning is a really really powerful thing as well but then what it can also do is it'll get to a point where um if if we find that this type of question or this type of um um task that it has given you doesn't really make sense to you. It might make sense to someone else. Like in the in the schoolroom, it's like there was times where a teacher would say something. I'm like, I just don't understand. I'd be like, I still don't get it. Can you explain it to me differently? And then they explained it differently. I'm like, oh, I get it. Having AI to go, you know what? We're going to produce it in a different way. We're going to ask the question differently, which can still lead to the same outcome. Will rapidly increase your child's ability to learn, retain, um, and utilize information because. That's really what education is. Education is information in in a multitude of different avenues that we can then use, hopefully, in our everyday life to live a happy, successful, you know, joyful life. So before we wrap up on this topic, Alan, I mean, we could talk about this for hours. Um, what else do you want families to know um, as it pertains to, you know, navigating the digital frontier as it as it links Look, to learning? I I suppose I would want to say more than anything else, parenting is a really hard job. Like we know parenting is a hard job and it was hard enough when phones first came out and people would say, you've got to be checking what your child's looking at or searching or, and, and that all seemed fine or at least manageable when there was just the phone. And now there's not just the phone. Now there's so many ways that kids are, are on technology. And so really the most important thing that you can really work on is communication and that relationship with your child, because whether you like it or not, it doesn't matter how well your intentions are or how well you think you've set your child up for success in this digital landscape that they're in. Like you said, AI, whether for good or for bad, it, it does train on what you're looking at. And sometimes, you know, a child will look at something and then all of a sudden negative, you know, we're, we're seeing this in the mental health area, you know, where negative um, impacts are happening because the child's being fed a negative information. So, it's about trying to keep the communication skills open, chatting about what they're looking at, what they're watching. And I'm talking about teenagers. I'm not talking about little tiny ones, but when they get to the stage where 
there needs to be that communication and trust. Um, it's going to be all coming down to that relationship that you're building and, and trying to navigate it that way. It's a, it's a really tough job. One thing I want to share, this is more of a tactical thing that you could do uh, because I understand how these algorithms work and sometimes you can get pulled into an algorithm just like to your point there is you could literally watch one specific video for 10 seconds too long and then all of a sudden this algorithm's like you love these type of videos and it's just going to produce you and put you down into a rabbit hole of all of these different things so here's something that you can do to to technically reset that now there's no button that just says reset my entire algorithm um, outside of going to create a brand new account but your child's never going to want you to go delete their account um, and I did this because I found this with Ayla so uh, again Ayla's turning three shortly and I gave her my phone we're out at breakfast and she's been a little boisterous. So I said, here's the phone. And I put on, um, one of her, one of her shows that she loves. Okay. Um, next minute I'm like, what's that? And I look at the phone. It's a totally different show. I'm like, wait on a minute. Like I know the steps required for you to get out of that video, to go and find another video and search another video. And she'd search for the vid, like she'd gone. I was just like, what in God's green earth has happened? She swipes up, moves across this, that, and she's using this phone like better than my mother uses her mobile phone. I'm like, she's not even three, right? Um, and I was just like taken back by that. But what it does is then I notice because she uses my YouTube premium account as well, which it's it's quite funny actually. I, I open up my YouTube premium and I've got a couple of shows that I like. And then all of a sudden there's like George the Monkey and there's you know, blues clues in my suggested feed for me. That's, it's hilarious. I didn't, I did need to get her a different account, but anyway, that's a side note. But what it does is it trains your algorithm to give you more of that thing. And there was a few videos that popped up that she'd just stumbled upon. I'm like, no, I don't want them. So I'm going to go and delete from that channel and move, move away from that type of content. But here's a, here's a tip that I'll get back to is for like TikTok, especially because TikTok, TikTok's algorithm was one of the first major shifts in um, addictive content and addictive behavior because Facebook and Instagram were predominantly, well, they were made based off connection graphs. So it would find you more similar people to you. Like you have an, you and this person also like these other 10 fan pages. Um, so you must be interested. So we're going to connect you as humans. TikTok doesn't care who you're connected with. They want, they're more of an interest graph. So if you're interested in the, in the, and this is, this is where it sort of happened to me. I started watching, I seen a video of a guy mowing lawns and I, for some reason I was just, I just watched him mow this whole lawn like fast. It was sped up. It, it, it fed to all my dopamine. He's got his whippersnapper out. He's like, ding, ding, ding. This massive long lawn turned into this beautiful looking golf green. I was like, wow. And then all of a sudden I was just fed all of these videos about mowing and I'm like, what, where's my algorithm gone? So I, I basically... And it happened within like a couple of day period. It was quite crazy how quickly it happened. Um, but the tip that I'll share with you is if you're, if you're in an algorithm that you don't like, go into the search bar of TikTok or even Instagram, but TikTok especially, this is more of a TikTok hack, is go in there and search something that you like. If you love kittens, just go kitten videos or something and then go and watch a few of them for a few minutes and then it'll, it'll literally start to rewire your, um, your feed. And I think that's the important part here is because most people don't understand the gravitas of how these these uh, algorithms are really working and, and what they serve. And that's why I say really tread carefully with what you type into ChatGPT or any sort of um, shooter bot or any type of thing that has been trained on worldwide information as well, because it's going to give you a potentially a biased um, and this is one of the biggest struggles because they're trying to make AI not biased, but it already is. There's proof that it is. Um, that's why you need sources of different information. At least with Google search, you can see whilst that's still biased because if you pay money, you sit at the top of the thing and you're most likely to get clicked on, right? So that's that's a different game within itself. But I just want to urge every every parent to, you know, tread carefully. Not in a, it's, it's not a... You know, I don't want to raise a red alert, but just tread carefully and just make sure um, you're sourcing information from multiple different sources uh, and you don't let technology use you. You must use it. So with that, Alan, let's wrap up this episode. 
what we would love to hear though is if we'd love to hear what you know as a as a parent yourself what's your strategy around social media and technology for your uh, children what do you let them do what don't you let them do you might have some hacks and tips that you can share with us myself and Alan and of course all of our listeners as well so make sure you uh, wherever you can leave us a comment on Apple Spotify YouTube anywhere where this show is wherever you find it whether you're on any social media platform we'd really really appreciate that so Alan it's been a pleasure and I will speak to you on the next episode well I'm actually going to speak to you a lot sooner than that but to our amazing listener we're going to we're going to uh, see you in the next episode